some of you because uh, I see you recognize what day it is and you got your green on. Uh, the rest of you, I'm going to have to pinch on the way out because it's my duty as a, um, as an Irishman to, to do so. Um, St. Patrick's Day has always been a big deal in the Gallagher house, especially when I was growing up. My parents actually got married on, on St. Patrick's Day. And we uh, were able just a few years ago to trace our heritage back to a couple of families that came over um, during the Great Potato Famine, as so many did um, um, back in the 1800s from Ireland. So um, that was that was neat. So there's a long heritage uh, for us there. And St. Patrick himself um, is the well, he's to be thanked for a lot of Irish immigrants making an American holiday about an Irish preacher um, and here giving us a holiday in the middle of March where we are compelled to wear green or get pinched, um, where we eat corned beef and cabbage. I don't know if y'all are doing that. We are later on. My kids love it. They ask for it all the time. They do not. They do not. They, um, they suffer through it for their dad. Um, and, so, and even in you know some places like Chicago, I don't know if they did it this year, but in years past they have, they actually dye the Chicago River green um, for St. Patrick's Day. Um, that's not really the most important thing about St. Patrick's Day, though. The, the interesting thing about him was that as a young man, as a, as a child, a teenager, I believe, he was kidnapped and taken to Ireland and served as a slave there for years and years and years. Then he escaped and got out of Ireland and did one of the, the craziest things you can imagine because he was, became a follower and a minister of the Lord. He went back to Ireland on his own volition and by the leading of the Lord to be a missionary there and to bring Christ to folks who believed in Druidism and, and all kinds of false religions back then and false gods. He did neat things like um, teach them about the Trinity by using the shamrock. That's why the shamrock is so associated with St. Patrick's Day, um, by using the three sections to represent God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He did not... I believe, anyway, chase all of the snakes out of Ireland. That was one thing he is accredited for. I don't think it actually happened. If it did, he would be an even bigger hero in my book because I would love anybody to chase all the snakes out of the world because um, I don't like them. But uh, um, the funny thing about St. Patrick in the, this day that we are celebrating is that it lines up with what we have been going through in the, the Passion Week of Christ. Because St. Patrick, as I told you, he went and taught the people of Ireland about the truth of Jesus, spending years and years preaching many sermons there. And what we are going to see in the life of Jesus in his last weeks of ministry and ministering to those who were hearing about the kingdom of God themselves and seeing it made real through the person of Jesus Christ is particularly what Jesus wanted to communicate with his last sermon to his people. And so far in the Passion Week, we've seen what happened the weekend before and on the Friday before the Friday of Jesus' crucifixion, so one week before his crucifixion, he raised Lazarus from the dead and got everybody stirred up because that didn't happen often or ever that someone came back from the dead. He raised Lazarus from the dead and in doing so pointed to the fact that he was going to die and be raised as well and that he was the way for all of us to have eternal life. On the next day, Jesus has dinner with Lazarus and his family. He has di dinner with this man because he was really alive. He wasn't just, you know, um, run through with a lot of electricity and moved around a little bit. So people thought he was alive. He was really alive, hanging out with Jesus, having supper. And on that day as well, Lazarus' sister washed Jesus' feet with her hair and expensive perfume 
pointing to the fact, as Jesus said, that his burial was coming soon. And then on Sunday, it was Palm Sunday, the first Palm Sunday, and Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And then on that, that Monday, Jesus goes to the temple and chases out those who were there trying to make money, um, trying to dishonestly make money off of God's people who were trying to worship. That brings us to Tuesday. And Tuesday in a normal week wouldn't seem like that big of a deal. You know, uh, Monday is always a big deal because it's the beginning of the week and you got to jump back into the, to the work week. Tuesday is just kind of there. Wednesday is the, you know, over the hump week. Thursday is just to get through to Friday week. And then Friday is basically the weekend, right? So, but Tuesday sits out there just waiting for something good to happen. Uh, and it, something really good happens on this Tuesday couple of really good things that we're going to look at about look at that in just a moment we're going to see what Jesus chooses to focus on on this last Tuesday of his life before he is executed for our sins we're going to see what is really important to him and he, what he wants to be important for us if it's the last thing he tells us which it is the last thing he tells his followers publicly he tackles two of the most challenging subjects in the kingdom of God. One is called sanctification. That's us being made more like Jesus, so becoming more like Jesus. The other is the second coming, when Jesus comes back to make things right on the earth. And if I just said this morning that what we're going to do in the course of this message is we're going to get to the bottom and we're going to have the final answers on sanctification, how you become more like Jesus. And we're going to get to the bottom of it. We're going to have the final answers on his second coming. Um, you, would, you would probably run out the doors because you know that it means we're going to be here for a couple of weeks until we, until we get to the bottom of it. We're not going to do that. We're not going to get to the bottom of all those things. We are going to hit on them. But what we're going to do is, is see why it was so important to Jesus that he touched on these two topics as the last thing he said to his people before he was crucified. So the first one is just what I said. We're going to talk about these two things that Jesus left us here to do and to be. And the first one is this, talking about sanctification. He left you here to be sanctified. Now that word sanctification sounds like a um, sounds like something you would do to something during COVID to get it you know clean so it could come in your house. Um, it's not 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 that. Um, it's not sanitation, really. Uh, it's sanctification. It means being set apart. It means being set apart from how we used to be and what we would be like on our own to be for God, for His kingdom, to be like Jesus in this world. One of the hardest things for us to understand as Christians and as human beings, really, is that we are not sanctified by our own works. Did you know that? We are not sanctified by our own works. But if you went to a lot of churches or talked to a lot of Christians or heard a lot of Christian teaching, you might think that it was up to us to get ourselves straight. And that how well we get ourselves straight tells whether or not we are good Christians. What Jesus teaches here, in case you're wondering, this is Matthew 23, we're going to be getting this from. Matthew 23, starting in verse 1, if you're not there already. What Jesus teaches here is that we are to be changed from the inside out. From the inside out. So look at Matthew 23 verses 1 through 7. This is what Jesus said. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples. So he's in public here. Saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. 
For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats of the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Then skip down to verse 23, if you would. Jesus continues his message to them. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. As we say in the preaching world, Jesus is laying it down for the Pharisees um, on this day. And this is why. Throughout the course of Jesus' earthly ministry, those the, particularly the two and a half to three years that leads us up to this point, the Pharisees have been nothing but a thorn in his side. At least they tried to be. They questioned Jesus at every turn, and publicly so, trying to trick him into a, an answer that um, was going to um, re- reveal some lack on his part or trying to trap him in a question that could not be answered one way or the other without offending um, someone or contradicting some other truth. They, as you well know, from the point of Lazarus' resurrection on, hated him so much because he was a threat to their power and their position. They hated him so much that even though he was the one that they purported to be looking for as their Messiah to come and deliver them from their their sin, they sought to kill him, the words of Scripture. From that point on, they sought to kill him. And eventually they succeeded. The twistedness that we see in their hearts and lives although we see it clearly in them and we, are, we detest it in them and we hate how they treated Jesus and how they betrayed him and how they were responsible for handing him over to be crucified. That same stuff dwells in us as God's people. As I said before, as Christians, we find it very hard to comprehend or at least to live as though we believe that us being changed to be like Jesus is not something that we can do on our own. It's, a, it's an act of God's grace working in us, cooperating with him in that, cooperating with the Holy Spirit to change us. We have this principle down as Baptist Christians pretty well when it comes to salvation, We know that when scripture says, by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast, so that no one can say, I saved myself. We've we've got that down pretty much now. There there is still argument about that um, in various circles, but we've pretty much got that part down. Where we lose control of the car is when we get to this point of sanctification and becoming more like Christ. Throughout the years, we have taken on this notion. It's not new to us. It's been going around since since the beginning of the church, even before the church, as we see in the Pharisees. We've gotten this notion that we need to clean ourselves up, clean ourselves up so that we appear to be spiritual 
and biblically knowledgeable and holy and even at times, though we might not say it, holier than thou. Have you ever heard that phrase before? Don't live by it. It's not new to us um, because the, we see the religious people in Jesus' day doing the same thing and throughout the church. There have been over the years, and these are the kind of things that I have had to wrestle with as an adult Christian, attempts by people to basically codify the Christian life into um, a legal system. Uh, you may not be aware of these things, but um, the result of that is, you might guess it, legalism which is simply the, the notion that by following a set of rules, I can be made righteous. It's not true. It's not true. It never was true, it never has been true, it never will be true. The, the way that we are made righteous is by the righteousness of Christ being imputed to us, Scripture says, put upon us, us being seen in the righteousness of Christ by our Heavenly Father, and then being changed from the inside out by the presence of the Holy Spirit within us to be more like Christ. And that's why it says that the fruit of the Spirit in the book of Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness, self-control. Have you ever tried to do those things on your own? The whole, a lot of people do. One time, in preparation for a sermon, I did a search for self, self-help self books. The number was preposterous of how many there were. I'm talking about in the millions. And it's because we have this innate desire to, to be better than we are, than we have been, or than, you know, maybe somebody else is. Well, we can't do that on our own. Well, you can't make yourself to be more loving, more joyful, have more peace. But God can. And the problem with the Pharisees and the problem that happens to so many of us is that we become, rather than becoming motivated by the glory of God and our love for him, we become, become motivated by pride and comparing ourselves to others. That was definitely the Pharisees' problem. Because it says here in verse 5, all their works they do to be seen by men, that they may this to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad, which were um, leather boxes that they bound around their foreheads containing the scripture. I enlarge the border of their garments. They love the best places at the feast, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. They did it for themselves. They acted holy so they could be treated holier than thou. That should never be our goal. It should never be our motivation. Our desire for holiness ought to be because we know the one who is holy. And because we enjoy him so much, we enjoy what his holiness means for us and what it is for us to know it in him, in Jesus Christ, that we desire more of it and we desire to be more like him. And our, that should be our motivation. And then our goal should be to depend upon him, to ask the help of the Spirit, to do the things that God says we are to do as his people in his word. It is not something that we take and make a law. It's not something that we take and do on our own. It's something that God takes us and makes in us, and he wants you to be aware of that. Because I have, I have been... And I have seen so many Christians emotionally and spiritually exhausted by trying to be what they are not on their own by their own strength and thinking themselves nothing but a failure or thinking themselves better than others because they do one thing or don't do something else. It's a hoax. It's a hoax. And it will lead you to wrecking 
the vehicle rather than driving it to its intended destination. That kind of sanctification is not what God planned for us. He did not plan for us to clean ourselves up on the outside, put on the right clothes, say the right things, watch the right movies, listen to the right music, and think that it was going to make us sincerely more like Jesus. Typically, all it does is make us more like the Pharisees. Hypocritical, we do the things we're not supposed to do in the dark where no one can see them, and proud. We do the things that we do that are right so that we can be seen. This is not how God planned it. And it doesn't manifest saints that are truly like Christ. So what does? How do we, what does Jesus tell us? And what does the rest of his word tell us is going to make us like him? Ephesians chapter 2, that we read a minute ago, um, starts, chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, starts by saying, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It goes on to say this, though, in verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. How many of you, and maybe, maybe, some, maybe I'm being dangerous here, but maybe some are in here that has done this before. Have you ever made your own favorite pair of shoes? That's a weird question. I didn't say decorate them. That's different. <laughs> so uh, I know where you're going. But you, maybe you've got a favorite pair of shoes, and they're comfortable. They fit just right. When you put them on, the first thing you think is, you know what? I don't mind walking in these shoes a bit. I actually kind of like it. This feels right. I, I would say this because if I were to say I want the, the best pair of shoes I can to wear, I'm probably not going to go to the, to the leather store um, and to the rubber store, to the whatever else store, and get a, one of those industrial sewing machines and try to make my own pair of shoes because they would probably end up looking like something hideous and feel like something terrible that I would not want to walk in to get where I was going. So I trust somebody else to make my shoes, is what I'm trying to get at. And then I walk in them, if they fit and are comfortable. Jesus, uh, God tells us here that through Jesus Christ, we are created for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. We do not make the way for us to walk. God did. We do not make the way for us to be changed to be like Jesus. God has. We simply put on the shoes that he's made for us, and we walk in them, and we mess up, and we do well, and we mess up, and we do well. And through all these things, the Holy Spirit is ministering to us and changing us and perfecting us to be like Christ. We do not, should not try hurt ourselves when we do try to perfect ourselves. In Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul hits on this very important subject again. He says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He's not saying there to come about your own salvation, but to, since you are saved, to exercise it, work it out. With fear and trembling, that means humbly, not proudly. It goes on to say, verse 13, which has been, if I had a life verse, this is what it would be. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do, for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. That's a pretty tall order. 
Do all things without complaining and disputing. I'm going to be checking on you at work this week and seeing if that's how it actually went down. Did you do everything without complaining and disputing at home, at work? Mm, Probably not. That you may become blameless and harmless. Raise your hand if you've been absolutely blameless and harmless this week. Children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. When we're honest with ourselves, we realize that we can't do these things ourselves. And that's why the verse before that says, it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. You are safe and you are well off to stop trusting in yourself to make yourself more like Christ or trusting in anyone else or their rules or regiments. Instead, to believe that it is God who works in you and then yield to whatever work he is doing, whatever he is telling your heart to do or not to do, whatever he is telling your heart to repent of and to start up, whatever he is telling your heart to follow him in and follow him away from. He is able And you are able to be made like him because of his working. This is how we're going to fulfill the, if we do it all, the goal of our church this year, the part about multiplying disciples. Because being a disciple of Jesus means being someone who is disciplined, that's where we get the word disciple, by Jesus trained by him to follow him. I had a conversation with a friend of mine um, last week, um, and he is a doctor. And I, we have, I've known him for a while, and I have tried to open up, at times, conversations about religion and God and things like that. And I've been praying for that to happen. And finally, this week, the, the dam burst open. And um, I have been hinting at things and trying to pull stuff out of him. He's been kind of um, standoffish a little bit about it, but not too much. And he told me this week that he was raised uh, in, an, in the Catholic Church. And, um, but what he saw there wasn't what he imagined being like Christ was supposed to look like. And some thing, you know, some things happen as as often do in the life of young people. And he pulled away from the church when he was free to do so on his own because he did not believe that what he was seeing, the rules and the regulations and the um, those things, were what it me- meant to follow Jesus. And he was right because what he was seeing was legalism, and we still see it a lot today. And it's very tempting to follow it because we, it, we feel like it's going to make us feel certain that we are right and others are wrong. But what we decided that we were going to do, this will probably never happen. If you see my schedule, it'll, I know it'll never happen. But what we decided what we were going to do is we were going to collaborate on a book called Life After Legalism. Because I too was raised in a very legalistic environment. And it turned me off from the church when I was a young man. And when I went away to college, I still went to church because I felt like I was supposed to. But I would tell people that I never would go to the same church twice because I didn't want to be too connected or too affected by what was going on there. Because I didn't understand that what it was about was not what I had to do for Christ but all that he had done for me and won for me on the cross so that I could be more like him by the work of his spirit within me. And uh, the freedom found in such truth was what Jesus was preaching to the Pharisees 2,000 years ago, preaching to the people about the Pharisees. It's so much so that he said, listen, do 
what they say, but don't do what they do. That's literally what one of the verses Jesus said in Matthew 23 tells them. Do what they say, but don't do it like they do it, because they're not being genuine or sincere. And what he sincerely wants us to do, to be sincerely changed by him, to be sincerely sanctified, to be like him, is to believe in your heart that it is God who works in you to will and to do for his good pleasure. And walk with him as he does so. And be amazed by what he, how he does it. So, I spent a little bit longer on that than I meant to this morning. Um, and we're running short on time. I'm not even going to get to the second coming because uh, um, we're, I, I took so long talking about that. And the reason for it is probably without me even realizing, that, without even intending to take so long on it, is that uh, for me, um, and, I, and that's not terribly significant, but for Jesus, this was an important enough point to make with his last sermon. And I think part of it is because he knew that he was going to die. And even though he was going to be he was risen, that he was going to be leaving them. And he taught, had told them everything that was going to happen, that he was not going to leave them as orphans, that he was going to send the Holy Spirit to dwell within them and, and to minister to them. And, um, but he knew that without his presence physically in their sight line, in their view, they were going to struggle with how to live for his glory. And we still do now. And I want you to know that you can take comfort and find great confidence this morning, and I hope sincere freedom in Christ by trusting him that if he is able to save you from everything you've ever done wrong, which he is, that he's also able to make you everything he wants you to be. And he is. And he wants you to trust him for that this morning. So important to him was it that he chose it as a topic of his last sermon. Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount of Olives, which is also called Mount Olivet, which is how we got our name, which I didn't even get to get to this morning. But um, that's what he preached there. That's what he's preaching today. That's what he wants you to rest in as his child and trust him and walk with him in this week and for the rest of your life. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, we are... Um, thankful that the work you do in us is so much um, so much more and real and everything than we could do for ourselves I pray that you would help those here this morning to truly believe in the depths of their heart that it is your will for them to trust them, to trust you for your will. I pray that you would help them to surrender to you just as they are and ask you to make them just how you want them to be. I pray that you would give them a sense of relief from trying to uh, pretend that they have it all figured out or have it all together. That you would deliver us all from our attempts to clean ourselves from the outside in and instead let you change us from the inside out. Because I know that as we are walking in your spirit you will help us abide in you in your truth and live by it and that will come out on the outside of us of what we do and say and how we do it and say it 
We ask you this morning to do the work that you want to do in each one of our hearts and in this, your church, to multiply disciples in that way, starting with us. And we thank you for it. And we praise you for it, Jesus. And we ask that you will get all the glory and how you change us for your glory. Do that, we pray, by your Holy Spirit within us and according to the wonderful truth of you and your word. We ask it in your precious name, Jesus, and we thank you, Father God. Amen. Um, we're going to sing um, to close the lion and the lamb. Um,